This is part two, the biochemistry of human milk. We had just finished discussing in part one, the role of fats. Now we're moving on to fat soluble vitamins. Human breast milk contains ample quantities of most vitamins to support normal infant growth and development with the exception of vitamins D and K and B12. Vitamin A and E are present in adequate amounts and vitamin A aids in retinal development and protects against infection. Vitamin E functions as an antioxidant and protects red blood cells against hemolysis or the rupture of red blood cells. Let's look at vitamin D in a bit more detail. Besides its role in skeletal formation, there has been much discovered recently about the contribution of vitamin D or its deficiency to cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, and autoimmune diseases. There are also metabolic disorders, infectious diseases, and neurologic conditions that have been linked to a vitamin D deficiency. There have been reports from the Middle East, North Africa, Canada, Australia, England, and even the United States of deficiency and its extreme uh, symptom or disease rickets. Sunlight exposure and vitamin D supplementation are recommended for the breastfed infant. Formula-fed infants often have higher serum concentration of vitamin D metabolites than breastfed infants. So this sunshine vitamin, vitamin D, is a steroid hormone that is naturally present in very few foods, added to others, and is available as a dietary supplement. It's also manufactured endogenously when ultraviolet rays from sunlight strike the skin and trigger vitamin D synthesis. Vitamin D synthesis from the sun is dependent on season, time of day, location, altitude, air pollution, skin pigmentation, sunscreen use, filter, and aging. Vitamin D can be found in both the water and fat-soluble portions of human milk. Maternal supplementation with 400 to 2,000 international units of vitamin D a day can increase the levels of vitamin D in breast milk. However, only a higher dose, around 2,000 international units, can achieve acceptable infant levels. Normal vitamin D stores present at birth are depleted within 8 weeks. Infants who are exclusively breastfeeding receive below the minimum recommended intake of vitamin D. These infants are at risk for vitamin D deficiency, which can lead to inadequate bone mineralization and conditions such as hypocalcemia, which can lead to rickets. The symptoms include abnormal bone growth, muscle pain, and weakness. Those at highest risk for deficiency include those with dark pigmented skin, those living in the Northern Hemisphere, those with minimal sunlight exposure, those that live in inner cities, and infants, and specifically Hispanic male infants, formula-fed infants, and African-American infants. Vitamin K is essential to the protein involved in blood coagulation. However, only limited amounts of vitamin K are transferred from the placenta to the fetus. There is a higher concentration in colostrum than in mature milk, and later it is synthesized in the infant's GI system. Fetal stores of vitamin K are usually sufficient to hold them over until they begin their own production, but after birth, vitamin K supplementation is recommended to prevent hemorrhagic disease. Hemorrhagic disease symptoms include convulsions, feeding intolerance, poor sucking, irritability, and pallor. Routinely, infants are administered an oral dose or given an intramuscular injection, which is the more common dose in the U.S. A mother's diet can influence infant vitamin K availability. Increasing the mother's intake of vitamin K to greater than one milligram a day during the final weeks of pregnancy can reduce the risk of this disease. Taken during lactation, additional dietary or supplemental vitamin K increases breast milk concentration as well as infant plasma. Water-soluble vitamin levels vary with state of lactation, maternal intake, and if delivery takes place prematurely, they need to be obtained via the maternal diet. These include thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, panathetic acid, biotin, folate, vitamin B6, vitamin D B12, vitamin C, inositol, and choline. And I should mention that inositol is a vitamin-like substance found in many plants and animals. It is a sugar alcohol with half the sweetness of sucrose, table sugar. It has a number of functions and has a role in the secondary messengering in the signal transduction pathway. Inositol is involved in the central nervous system. Choline is similar to a B vitamin. It's an essential component of the human body. It's used in many chemical reactions in the body and seems to be important in the nervous system. It also has a number of other roles. In asthma, choline might help decrease swelling and inflammation. It can be made in the liver. It's found in foods such as liver, muscle, meats, fish, nuts, beans, peas, spinach, wheat germ, and eggs.
Human milk has a low percentage of minerals, which is ideal for not overloading the infant's immature kidneys. Minerals are attached to protein in human milk and are therefore more bioavailable. This is another example of the perfect balance of human milk nutrients and demonstrates that human milk is the ideal food for human infants. Numerous factors affect the levels of minerals in human milk. During pregnancy, so the list there of minerals that are available in human milk, um, just to cover calcium in a little bit more detail, human milk calcium is more bioavailable than bovine calcium. The bovine ratio of phosphorus to calcium can also hinder calcium absorption, which can explain the increased incidence of neonatal hypocalcemia in artificial milk feeders. Dehydration is also more likely during bouts of hot weather or GI upset, for example diarrhea, due to the higher mineral content. Artificial milk's greater solute load may lead to additional water requirements resulting in a thirsty baby. A thirsty baby may act like a hungry baby and parents who misjudge the signal may feed the baby artificial milk, just exacerbating the situation. Breastfed babies need no additional water as we've discussed earlier, even those in dry, hot, arid climates. There is little waste to flush out of the kidneys as breast milk is more completely metabolized. A breastfed infant's thirst will be satisfied with supplementary breastfeedings. These breastfeeding sessions may only last for a couple of minutes until the infant's thirst is satisfied. And moms, again, should be encouraged that at times infants will breastfeed for short periods of time if all they're doing is breastfeeding to satisfy thirst. There are other trace elements such as copper, chromium, and cobalt present in human breast milk. There's also iron, iodine, fluoride, zinc, manganese, and selenium. Silicon, aluminum, and titanium are also among the multitude of trace minerals in human milk. And all of these, again, are ongoingly being studied to determine their full contribution and significance. We do know that zinc deficiency during infancy can cause failure to thrive in skin lesions. Again, for the purposes of this course, we won't go into great detail uh, about most of these trace elements, just a few. Iron is a mineral that is found in many proteins and enzymes that the body requires in order to stay healthy. Most of the iron in our bodies is found inside hemoglobin, the iron-containing pigment in red blood cells that carries oxygen from the lungs to the body. Iron is an essential part of hemoglobin as well as myoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein that provides oxygen to muscles. Iron is also crucial for growth, development, normal cellular functioning, and synthesis of some hormones in connective tissue. Hemoglobin transports oxygen from the lungs to all of the tissues and organs in the body. If there isn't enough iron in the blood, the amount of hemoglobin in the blood also decreases. This can reduce the oxygen supply to cells and organs. Low levels of iron lead to iron deficiency and can then lead to iron deficiency anemia. Women have multiple prenatal blood tests. Some of those include hemoglobin or hematocrit. Hematocrit test measures the percentage of red blood cells in a sample of blood. If these levels are low, serum iron levels are also measured. If iron deficiency anemia is detected early on, supplemental treatment can begin using iron supplements as well as dietary adjustments. At the start and towards the end of pregnancy, hemoglobin levels above 11 grams per deciliter are regarded as normal. Between three and six months of pregnancy, a small decline to 10.5 grams per deciliter is also considered to be within normal limits. During pregnancy, healthy, non-anemic women offer their iron via the placenta to their unborn child. They also store sufficient iron stores to provide her baby via human milk ample iron for the first several months, again if they are healthy and non-anemic. The iron stores of infants are not depleted until they are four to six months of age or even later. Although the iron delivered through breast milk is in small amounts, it is satisfactory through four months for normal, healthy, term infants. Standard supplementation of iron may have a negative effect on breastfed infants as lactoferrin loses its ability to inhibit the growth of bacteria when it's saturated with exogenous iron. Iron status improves when infants, in combination with human milk, begin eating iron-rich foods. Full-term healthy babies receive enough iron from their mothers in the third trimester of pregnancy to last for the first four months of life. At birth, a healthy infant's hemoglobin level is high at around 18 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. As the weeks and months pass, hemoglobin drops rapidly. 
By four months of age, infant hemoglobin is between 10.2 to 15 grams per deciliter. It also transitions from fetal to adult form. The adult hemoglobin is a much more efficient transporter than fetal hemoglobin, so even though the iron levels have plunged, the efficiency rises. Human milk contains little iron, although it is highly bioavailable. Even still, currently the AAP recommends some supplementation. For infants who are exclusively breastfed, they consider them to be at increased risk of iron deficiency after four months of age. The AAP recommends giving breastfed infants one milligram per kilogram a day of a liquid iron supplement until iron-containing solid foods are introduced at about six months of age. When solid foods are added to the baby's diet, they recommend to continue breastfeeding until at least 12 months. For babies who are partially breastfed, the iron recommendation remains the same as that for fully breastfed infants if more than half of the daily feedings are from human milk and the child is not receiving iron-containing complementary foods. For formula-fed infants, it is recommended that an iron-fortified formula containing 4 to 12 milligrams of iron be used from birth through the entire first year of life. Premature babies have fewer iron stores, so they often need additional iron beyond what they receive from breast milk or formula. Looking at iron a little more closely, there are two forms of iron. There's heme iron, which is found in meat, chicken, seafood, turkey, pork, and eggs. And there's the non-heme form that's found in plants. And we covered um, iron in the basic nutrition and nutrition education module in greater depth. The takeaway from this slide is that the heme iron is more, is more readily bioavailable and heme iron actually helps non-heme iron be absorbed more efficiently and more quickly. Vitamin C enhances iron absorption. So does lactose. Calcium suppresses iron absorption. Many times in my experience as a prenatal or pediatric dietitian, I have found that it may not be that children or grown-ups take little iron or don't take enough iron, but that they have so much milk or milk products in their diet that the calcium really suppresses the iron intake. And so calcium intake can be a huge factor when looking at iron deficiency anemia. One of the things to make sure of is emphasizing that although calcium is a very important nutrient, excessive calcium can be detrimental when it comes to suppressing the absorption of iron. Too much calcium can lead to iron deficiency anemia. What are two components of breast milk that assist with iron absorption? Lactose and vitamin C assist with iron absorption. Also remember that the heme form of iron also helps iron absorption as well. Who is at a higher risk for iron deficiency anemia? Prenatal individuals who are at higher risk for anemia include those with a multiple pregnancy, those with a short interval between pregnancies, those who experience excessive vomiting due to morning sickness, pregnant teens, and those with a poor dietary intake of iron. The infants that are at higher risk for anemia include preterm infants and those with a low birth weight. This slide highlights all of the constituents in human milk that have multiple functions. We've talked about most of these before and we'll be covering some of these in a few minutes. In the United States, approximately 12% of infants are born preterm prior to 37 weeks gestation. Premature infants are a heterogeneous group with widely differing needs for nutrition and immune protection with risk of growth failure, developmental delays, necrotizing enterocolitis, and late onset infections increasing with decreasing gestational age and birth weight. Human milk from women delivering prematurely has more protein and higher levels of many bioactive molecules compared to milk from women delivering at term. Human milk must be fortified for small, premature infants to achieve adequate growth. A mother's own milk improves growth and neurodevelopment and decreases the risk of necrotizing enterocolitis and late-onset sepsis and should therefore be the primary enteral diet of premature infants. Donor milk is a valuable resource for premature infants whose mothers are unable to provide an adequate supply of milk, but presents significant challenges including the need for pasteurization, nutritional and biochemical deficiencies, and limited supply. Preterm milk is higher in protein, fat, sodium, 
chloride and free amino acids. It's lower in lactose. Fatty acids are variable according to inner uterine levels and profiles. Term babies can convert long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids into docosahexaenoic acid as well as ARA, arachidonic acid, while preterms cannot. However, preterm breast milk does have a higher fatty acid content than term birth milk. In preterm birth, the transmission of these fatty acids, DHA and ARA, are interrupted. They travel from the placenta to the fetus during that critical last trimester. A preterm birth interrupts the supply. Studies show that decreased postnatal docosohexanoic acid and arachidonic acid blood levels in premature infants are associated with neonatal morbidities. Thus, after birth, the preterm infant is dependent on an adequate supply from the mom's diet for sufficient fatty acid levels. Adding DHA and AA to preterm infant formulas led to initial beneficial effects on visual acuity or sharpness, visual attention, and cognitive development compared with infants receiving no supplementation. Growth is probably the biggest concern in providing human milk to premature babies. Term infants undergo rapid growth in the third trimester of pregnancy. Term infants undergo rapid growth in the third trimester of pregnancy and receive nutrition through the placenta and through swallowed amniotic fluid. They have no need to expend calories for temperature regulation or respiration. Premature infants miss out on much or all of the third trimester and thus have higher nutritional requirements on a per kilogram basis than term infants. Human milk was designed to nourish the term infant who can tolerate large fluid volumes, whereas premature infants are less tolerant of high fluid volumes. For these reasons, human milk is generally fortified for premature infants with a birth weight of less than 1,500 grams. Human milk fortifier powders were developed from bovine milk to supplement key nutrients with particular emphasis on protein, calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D. Fortification of human milk leads to improved growth in weight, length, and head circumference. However, improvements in bone mineralization and neurodevelopmental outcomes are unclear. Recent studies suggest that higher protein intake is beneficial for premature infants. As we have discussed, there is large variation in the energy and fat content of human milk between mothers, over time in a given mother, between foremilk and hind milk, etc. Protein content decreases over time of lactation and is likely to be much lower in donor human milk than milk from mothers delivering prematurely. Many current NICU practices are based on the assumption that human milk has approximately 0.67 kcals per milliliter with a stable protein content. Protein intake from standard fortification is significantly lower than actual protein intake, and therefore these observations have led to clinical trials of individualized fortification, that is, adjusting the amount of added protein based on actual measurements of either milk samples or based on lab values. Both methods have led to increased protein intake as well as improved growth. A recent trial of a human milk fortifier with higher protein content demonstrated increased growth and fewer infants with weight below the 10th percentile. Use of commercial human milk fortifiers, however, is not without complications, but it is uh, beyond the scope of this lecture. When parental milk is unavailable, pasteurized donor milk is recommended for preterm infants. During pasteurization, a heat treatment to destroy pathogens, some of the bioactive benefits tend to be reduced, such as those benefits from secretory immunoglobulin A and lysozyme. There are still improved outcomes when compared to formula use in the hospital and after discharge. What is usually added to preterm breast milk and why? In premature birth, the transmission of the fatty acids DHA and ARA are interrupted. They travel from the placenta to the fetus during that last critical trimester. After birth, the preterm infant is dependent on an adequate diet for sufficient fatty acid levels. Adding DHA and AA to preterm breast milk leads to initial beneficial effects on visual acuity or sharpness, visual attention, and cognitive development compared with infants receiving no supplementation. Explain why donor breast milk is pasteurized and what are the consequences.
donor breast milk is pasteurized for safety, for health concerns. During pasteurization, a heat treatment to destroy potential donor pathogens, some of the bioactive benefits are reduced, including secretory immunoglobulin A and lysozyme. There are still improved outcomes when compared to formula use in the hospital and after discharge. So let's look at colostrum. Colostrum is the residual or remaining combination of materials present in the mammary glands and ducts. Its manufacture begins at approximately 120 days gestation. A few days after birth, it mixes with the newly formed milk. Colostrum is often secreted prenatally, and this is what leaks during pregnancy, and then it's secreted for several days after birth. Its characteristically high protein composition is complementary to the infant's initial rapid growth. It is generally thought of as a baby's first immunization. Colostrum secretions begin with lactogenesis 1 at around week 16 during gestation. Colostrum is a high-concentrated, high-density, thick, gel-like, yellow-colored pre-milk, and its yellow color is due to beta-carotene. It is semi-transparent and even sticky. The swift increase in milk volume parallels a newborn's increasing stomach capacity. Colostrum contains water, protein, fat, carbohydrates in the form of lactose, minerals, and many vitamins. It's higher in protein, fat-soluble vitamins and certain minerals, such as sodium, potassium, zinc, and chloride, and it does contain less fat and lactose than mature milk. Colostrum provides the most advantageous foundation for a healthy gastrointestinal system. Humans have an extensive bacterial ecosystem or biome residing in their GI tracts. This ecosystem is designed to metabolize food and supplies with energy and nutrients. As a baby's GI system is relatively sterile or empty of microorganisms, the first microorganisms that enter into their GI system must be beneficial bacteria. In addition, the long-term health and well-being of the individual depends to a large extent on the health and well-being of their GI. Multiple conditions and disease states, ranging from inflammation, motility issues, cancers, liver disease, malabsorption, etc., are reliant on the status of their GI biome. The first few days are significant, and offering human milk with beneficial bacteria is key to getting the best start to lifelong wellness. Immunologically, colostrum also contains white blood cells, immunoglobulins, lymphocytes, and lysosomes. Later in the module, we'll cover immunity more extensively. Colostrum has important growth factors. It's a natural lubricant, and because of its lysozyme as well as other properties, it is bactericidal, meaning it again destroys harmful bacteria. Colostrum's primary function is protective, not to provide energy. Colostrum coats the GI wall to prevent adherence of pathogens and promotes gut closure, as well as to prepare the infant's stomach to receive nutrition. Colostrum is comprised of 70% leukocytes as compared to only 10% immature milk. The leukocytes protect against infection and foreign invaders, and they help by closing the GI intestinal wall swiftly in times of penetration by outside pathogens and antigens. An antibody, also known as an immunoglobulin, is a large Y-shaped protein produced mainly by plasma cells, and this is used by the immune system to neutralize pathogens such as harmful, disease-causing bacterial and viruses. We've talked about secretory immunoglobulin A. We mentioned that it's particularly high in the first few days, the first 72 hours post-delivery, to protect from exposure of environmental microorganisms. Biologically active, it's only available via human milk. It is not available in formula, and babies do not produce it until they are around six months of age. Other immunoglobulins or antibodies are also present, IgM and IgG. Even though babies do receive many of their circulating antibodies during pregnancy, the high levels of IgA and other antibodies offer additional and much needed protection. Colostrum supports the colonization of bifidus flora in the GI. Bifidus flora is simply the normal helpful bacteria and additional microbes that facilitate the growth of beneficial bacteria, specifically lactobacillus bifidus. It also assists with the passage of meconium, which is the neonate's first stool. This laxative effect stimulates the infant's bowels to begin eliminating waste efficiently. Expedient excretion of waste is crucial in lowering the rate and severity of jaundice. Now, 90% of cells are white cells. Now, what are white cells? Well, you can see them in literature called WBCs. Um, they're also called leukocytes. They're a central part of the immune system. 
These cells help fight infections by attacking bacteria, viruses, and germs that invade the body. White blood cells originate in the bone marrow but circulate throughout the bloodstream. Another type of white blood cell are the lymphocytes. They are also one of the body's main types of immune cells. These consist of B cells and T cells. And again, lysozyme. It, like the other immune factors, protects us from the ever-present danger of bacterial infection. It's a small enzyme and it specifically strikes at the protective cell walls of bacteria. Bacteria build a very, very tough outer skin and lysozyme targets what is protecting the harmful bacteria. Colostrum also has a variety of growth factors, one of which is lactoferrin. Lactoferrin, again, is the glycoprotein that assists with the transport of iron. It also has interleukin and epidermal growth factor. Epidermal growth factor, or EGF, stimulates cell growth, proliferation, and differentiation. The function of colostrum is primarily protective. It contributes around 67 calories per deciliter, or around 18.76 calories an ounce. The low quantity of colostrum is actually advantageous. It invites frequent feeding, and that frequent feeding in turn promotes a greater supply. The low quantity, which distresses so many women when they are unprepared, encourages milk production. Let's look at colostrum's low volume a little bit further. Mothers really do need assurance that the quantity of colostrum provided is more than sufficient to provide for baby's needs in most cases. And in most cases, it is plentiful when compared with the capacity of an infant's stomach. Any addition or substitution to colostrum interferes with immunity and future milk production. This table demonstrates the range of approximate quantity of colostrum per day the mean per day as well as the range per day. It also shows the capacity of an infant's stomach, which for the majority of infants is much smaller than the amount of colostrum available. The sixth column shows the approximate intake per feed and then the intake per day, further demonstrating that colostrum is generally available in ample amounts to satisfy the needs of the baby. As you can see on day one, the quantity of colostrum produced is only about 50 to 40 mLs. On average per day, it's around 37 mLs. The range per day is from 7 to 122.5 mLs, and that's a huge range. But look at the stomach capacity. 7 mLs is the stomach capacity of a day-old baby. Per feed, they take in about 1.5 mLs, and per day, it's only about 10.2 at the low range to 108.8 at the higher range. Again, you can see how widely variable um, the colostrum quantity is throughout this first week. On day three, you can see that the quantity of colostrum is boosted. It goes from you know, 50 to 40 mLs to 300 to 400 mLs. Per day, there's a, around 408 mLs. And the range per day goes from 98.3 all the way up to 775 mLs. On day three, however, the stomach capacity of a baby is only around 27 mLs. The intake per day is about 78 to 408 mLs. Again, on day three, it clearly shows that the stomach capacity of an infant is much smaller than generally what is available in terms of the colostrum produced. On day five, there's around 500 to 800 mLs of colostrum produced. Again, that's, that's shot up quite a bit. Per day, the mean colostrum is around 705 mLs. The range per day is anywhere from 425.5 to 876 mLs, and the stomach capacity, as you can see, the, you know, the stomach is getting stretched out here, is around 57 mLs. On average, the intake per day is around 129 to 705 mLs. Now, colostrum does have less calories than mature milk. Colostrum is 18.76 calories per ounce, as compared to around 20 for mature milk. As colostrum gives way to transitory, then mature milk, an increase in calories, lactose, and fat is seen. As we've talked about earlier, protein decreases, and immunoglobulins also decrease over time. Transitional milk exists from approximately day 5 through day 12. 
there is an intermediate composition between colostrum and mature milk while volume continues to increase. Macrophages, as part of white blood cells, continue to rise in concentration. So as you can see from this slide, in colostrum, the calories are around 670 per liter, and in mature milk, it bumps up to 750 per liter. Protein per liter, there are about 32 grams in colostrum. In mature milk, as you can see, it really drops significantly. It goes down to around 9 grams per liter in mature milk. Lactose begins at only about 20 grams per liter, and then it jumps up in mature milk to 35 grams per liter. Fat also increases. It starts off at around 12 grams. Again, these are averages 12 grams per liter, and it jumps up to around 38 per grams in mature milk. So let's look at the immunoglobulins. You can look at the immunoglobulins on day one, and you can see how high immunoglobulin G, M, and A are. As you can see going across the table, that going from day one to day three to day seven to day eight through 50, you can see how they are decreasing over time. What is the primary function of colostrum? Protective. It offers immunity to the baby in a variety of forms. Why is the low volume of colostrum beneficial? The low volume of colostrum is beneficial because it invites frequent feeding, and that frequent feeding in turn promotes a greater supply. The low quantity, which distresses so many women when they are unprepared, actually encourages milk production. Again, managing expectations with your clients will go a long way to ensuring successful breastfeeding. This is the end of part two, Biochemistry of Human Milk.